Hi, everyone. It's Lindsay Baker with Action Hour, and I'm here today with Serena Favre, who is um, a vegan educator and speaker, and she's going to talk to us about what it's like to be born vegan. And right now, currently, she is on the Vegan Van Tour, something she put together, and she's going to talk all about it. Serena, thank you so much for being here today. How are you doing? And tell us a little bit about how this all got started, where you decided to go in your van and go on tour. Tell us about that. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, it was a very, uh, I, I didn't choose it originally, but my, you know, a big piece of my philosophy and how I educate people is I believe we all need to be the change we want to see in the world. And, and that, you know, living that change, being that change, being a walking billboard, an example for the values that we say we care about and actually living them. And so I, you know, that, so that, that's kind of how I approach everything. And then when it came to the van, I'm always looking for unique, creative ways to be that walking billboard, to get the message out there. And I had a friend that actually built out the camper van that I'm living in now. So she put solar panels on it, a bed, converted it, did all of that. And I had the opportunity to take a few road trips with her and originally was like, no, this is not for me. Like, this is this is really fun. This is great for a weekend. But like to live in this is a whole nother thing. Um, and I just it, it kind of came to me like, well, what if I, you know, covered it in vegan information and could be a drive, you know, walking, driving billboard wherever I went? you know, think about all those seeds I could be planting and then think about how efficient and money saving it would be if I actually just moved into it too. And then what if I combine well, I this? I wanted to stop you there yeah. for a moment <laughs> okay. and just ask you. Yeah, because there's so much to unpack here. So um, maybe you could describe to us, I would have loved to show the inside and, you know, I know this is a trend now that a lot of people, younger people are going off with on in vans not all of them are vegan. A lot of them are, though. And what is it like to live in a van? Like, how do you, I, how do you eat? How do you sleep? If you don't mm -hmm. mind, where do you go to the bathroom? The whole thing. Can yeah. you just go into that a little for us? Yeah, of course. So, so I, my van is a very tiny camper van. So it has a bed in the back. Um, it, it's pretty short, as you can see there. Not super tall either. And um, so it has a bed in the back that takes up, you know, the whole length behind the passenger seat and, and it kind of serves as a couch during the day and then, you know, a bed and then there's some shelving and storage under it. I do not have a uh, running water or a kitchen or a fridge or anything wow. like that. So it's, it's mainly a bed and storage, but it does have solar panels on the roof, which I think you might be able to see in that picture a little bit. Oh, and those, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. those are, those are two big flat solar panels on the top. And then the, the white thing on the left, there is um, a fan. So uh, the fan is what I use for air conditioning in the back. And then the solar panels power everything. So I do have a battery in the van inside that's separate from like the normal car battery. And it's hooked up to the solar panels and that allows me to power like lights and use my computer and run an instant pot. So that when it comes to cooking, basically I eat whatever I can make in an instant pot, one pot, dishes, oh. meals, you know, stuff like that. You know, uh, let me just see. I think I have you cooking here for a moment. Yeah, that was fun. So does it get boring eating out of an Instapot all the time? Or how do you make that creative? So you might have been able to see in that video, I do have a big giant spice rack above my door. 
uh, with lots of different herbs and spices. And I have, you know, vinegars and sauces. And it's honestly not that different than the way that I ate on my own when I had a house or apartment, because I like to eat pretty healthy whole foods meals and kind of you know, mix it up with different flavors. So I can I can cook rice and beans and lentils and curries and soups. And, you know, all of that can still be done in the instant pot. But my go to types of meals are usually like a grain. So rice or quinoa with whatever veggies. So in that one, you know, it was like zucchini and pepper, but I'll put sweet potatoes or potatoes, um, broccoli, cabbage, you know, so I mix up the veggies. So it's usually like a grain and veggies and then um, a bean afterwards, chickpeas, lentils, kidney beans, black beans, and then different flavorings. So I can make like, um, you know, a Mexican bowl with salsa, black beans and my taco or chili seasonings. Or I can do like tomato sauce or, um, you know, vinegars. Question, and so do I, you have yeah. a fridge? Do you have a fridge, a little mini <laughs> fridge? So how do you keep everything, uh, the veggies, I guess, can stay out? And what about you don't have, you don't even have uh, plant-based milk for your no. <laughs> Um, I can see why you said this is not for me, you know, <laughs> but you've gotten, you've gotten to the point where, so well, let me ask you one more question on the, the functionality. Um, like, so you, in order to go to sleep, you go park somewhere and then where do you bathe and where does all that, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah. So I have a gym membership to like crunch fitness or planet ah. fitness. Those are the two most common ones. They have locations all over the country and some of them even allow 24 hour parking. I haven't done much sleeping there, but um, you know, if you're in a, a dire situation, you can just stay there overnight in some of those locations. And then I, I go to the gym, which I do pretty regularly shower, clean up there. So that's a, a nice part of my routine. <laughs> Wow. And so, um, and so then you, where you sleep, you have to find places and you have to some, do you have to sometimes rent or I know you go and do yeah. lectures at universities too. Do they allow you to park there when you're there or how does um, that? No, they're, they're usually wor the worst for parking. Uh -huh. uh, it's, you know, they usually make you pay or you need a permit or, you know, um, uh -huh. but uh, I have not paid for parking yet. I look for like, you know, free, um, you know, camping spots basically. And there, there are lots of, it kind of depends on the city. Some cities have ordinances that say like no overnight, you know, no sleeping in your vehicle. Um, but other cities are, you know, don't say that at all. And so like, um, I recently came from St. Petersburg, Florida, which is a great life, a great place for van life because there's a park with free parking literally right by the beach and pier and there's always parking there and they've got you know public restrooms and so you can't park overnight there but there's all these neighborhood streets you know a block or two away so i sleep there just have to drive a block in the morning and then i like live at the beach during the day have access to a bathroom open my back doors right to the ocean um nice you know really nice <laughs> So some of the places are just very suitable for it, but then there are other places that are probably a little more difficult. And I would imagine, I'm just wondering, I know all the moms out there will be saying, what about the safety of, you know, that situation? So what do you say to those moms, those really great moms that we all love? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like my own. Yeah. Um, you know, it's actually like, there's a... I think it's fairly safe. Um, there's a lot of things you can do. So like when I'm looking for spots, I, there's an app I use as well where I can look at different free spots that people have parked. And I look for the ones that have the best ratings or most comments that people have left behind. Or when I pull up, I see a number of other vans there. That's, that's mm -hmm. one thing I look for, right? If it's a, a good spot that a lot of people use and you've got a bunch of other people around, that makes me feel a little bit safer. So I'm not just by myself in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then, um, you know, I have no windows in the back of my van and I have a curtain that blocks off the front as well as like blackout curtains up front. So when I pull up somewhere, um, one of the things I'll do when I'm ready to go to sleep at night, I usually have already gone to the gym or done whatever else I need to do for the night. 
Um, and so I get ready to pull up and sleep somewhere. And I put the blackout windows up on the front of my, my van there and crawl through the back. So no one ever even sees me get in mm -hmm. or out of the van at the place that I am, you know, sleeping for the night. So I'm, no one sees who it is. No one knows. It's just like the van, you know, and so I, I usually try to pull up kind of late just when I'm ready to sleep and then, you know, leave first thing in the morning. So where I sleep is usually different than, you know, where I'm hanging out or the other things I'm doing. Oh, great. Okay. Well, let's move on because there's so much I want to talk to you about. So the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, the most, the most amazing thing being born vegan. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I want to talk about you being a teacher and so many other things, but let's start with that. Yeah. So, so I, what that's like growing up. Yeah. So I, I was born and raised vegan in Kansas, the Midwest of all places. Oh my gosh. Which is people um, in the nineties. And it was, it was definitely ex an experience. Um, but, you know, my, I wasn't just sort of raised on a vegan diet. And I think that's important to distinguish. My parents always explained to me and taught me from a pretty early age why we were vegan. So it wasn't just something that we did or something that they just sort of dictated, but they explained it to me, especially the ethics. So I grew up, you know, visiting animal sanctuaries, attending circus protests and vegan conferences. Like they made sure to sort of bring me into the community at a very early age, understand the why, and really educate me so that I could make my own informed, you know, choices as I grew older as well. And I know you have an amazing YouTube channel, which we are going to put links up to all of the different links that you have to share with the audience. But I do have a little clip of you speaking about being raised vegan. Let's play that. It's very short. All right, so let's read the definition of brainwashing. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, brainwashing means the process of making someone believe something by repeatedly telling them it is true and preventing any other information from reaching them. So this is exactly what the meat, dairy, and egg industries are doing to society as a whole. Things like the beef checkoff program, the Got Milk campaign, and the school lunch program that requires a glass of milk to be offered to or set by every child's place during lunchtime. These things are brainwashing society by telling children and adults as a whole that we cannot survive and we have to eat meat, dairy, and eggs to be healthy. So all my parents really did was tell me the truth, which is we do not need to exploit, kill, or eat any animals or animal products to live happy and healthy lives. And furthermore, I actually think that my parents raising me to see past the form of propaganda that is telling society we need to eat animals allows me to think critically about so many other things in society so that I now no longer take anything at face value. And I don't just assume that what the government or society or what TV or advertisers are telling us is true. I think critically and I decide for myself what makes sense. So veganism has been one of the biggest blessings in my life and I am so grateful that I was raised vegan from birth. Wow, that was really great. Now I want to tell the viewers that they can watch the entire, I think it's like a 40 minute video on YouTube and tell us their, your, your name on YouTube. I'm looking to see if we have that here. Born Vegan. Born Vegan. And if they go to your website, bornvegan.org, you have a place where you can go right to all the YouTube videos. So that's really probably a good hub. Would you say yes, to go to your website? Mm -hmm. Everything yeah. is on my website, links to all my YouTube videos, podcasts, um, Instagram, all of that. So talk a little bit more about the whole situation. You were, of course, dress, addressing their, uh, oh, are your, are your, did your parents brainwash you because you were born <laughs> vegan? May, just maybe give our audience a little bit more on that, on the lecture you just gave. Tell them a little bit more what you said. Yeah. So, I mean, that was something that I kind of, or my parents got accused of, you know, growing up people would say things like, you know, well, to my parents, like, it's fine that you're vegan, but it's wrong of you to force your values on mm -hmm. your children, you know? And, and I see that, like, I, I hear that from parents today when they learn that I was raised vegan, like, oh, well, I would be vegan, but I would never force my kids to be vegan. And I just think that's, it, it really needs to be reframed because one, the whole idea 
that it's wrong of parents to, you know, force their values. Like that's only being pointed out when it comes to veganism. No one says that when a parent says they want to teach their kids to recycle or be an environmentalist or be kind and not bully children or, um, you know, even things like religion or culture and traditions. No one is like, don't force that on children. But then someone says they're going to raise their kids vegan and suddenly it's like, don't force your values on your kids. When really that is the job of parents. The job of parents is to say like, here's what being a good person in this world is. Like, I'm going to impart my my values and my wisdom on you. And so that, so I, I just think it really needs to be reframed. And additionally, the other thing that that framing of it ignores is that it acts like society is values neutral, like that it's just neutral and there's nothing good or bad. And that, you know, parents raising their kids vegan, they're doing something abnormal or different. They're the ones that are forcing values. But if a parent who's vegan doesn't share with their children what veganism is, why they're vegan and share their values, society is going to do that. And that's the clip you showed where I'm basically saying that society particularly the multi-million dollar corporate interests of the meat and dairy companies, they absolutely have an agenda. And their agenda is let's convince everyone to eat our products so that we can make a profit. And so if, if parents don't counter that information with the truth that we don't need to eat those things, then Mm -hmm. kids can easily fall prey to the billboards, the ads, the peer pressure. There's so much of that in society and so, so it's, it's part just, of it is about yeah. good parenting. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I have another clip I want to play here about uh, being vegan and going to school and being with other kids. Let me- Dietetics has stated that appropriately planned vegetarian, including vegan diets, are healthful, nutritionally adequate, and may provide health benefits for the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. These diets are appropriate for all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, adolescence, older adulthood, and for athletes. So no one needs to be concerned that vegan children are not getting enough nutrients. When I was growing up, I actually was on a competitive gymnastics team for about seven years until I was about 12 years old. And I was able to compete just fine and was right along with my other peers. And by the time I was 12 years old and on about level six, I was one of the few girls my age that had not broken a bone or had a really serious injury. In college, I also decided to run cross country about two years into my college career after not having been athletic for many years. I was able to join the cross country team, run and improve just fine. And then last year, I also trained for and ran a half marathon. So no one needs to be concerned and let's put that one to rest. The vegan diet and being raised vegan has not at all held me back. Wow. That that was just, you know, I was thinking about like how it would feel with your friends constantly, like everywhere you go, you can't really, you go to their house for a party and probably none of the food is vegan, correct? <laughs> was that sort of what, can you tell us a little bit, you know, being, growing up, adolescent is difficult, to be, adolescence is difficult. Just talk a little bit more about that now. Yeah. So, you know, we did have like a play group and some other family friends that were, you know, at least vegetarian or would provide vegan snacks. Um, And then I also had friends that weren't at all. And in most cases, you know, my parents, when I was younger, at least made sure to kind of talk with their parents and either they would send snacks over that I could then share with everyone. And they would tell the parents, you know, we're vegan, we have a special diet, like, you know, please just (laughs) eat the thing, you know, please serve the food from our snacks, you know, that we send. Um, Or they, you know, my parents would make sure that other parents at least understood veganism enough that they would provide vegan snacks while I was there. And for the most part, everyone was very respectful. um, And it was very helpful for me at a young age that I wasn't sort of having to navigate that completely on my own. And my parents were, you know, communicating with my my friends and peers' parents to kind of help facilitate that. And they did that in the schools, too. So, like, they would talk with my teachers and, you know, make up a bunch of, you know, vegan cupcakes or something. And then those would go in and be stored in the fridge or freezer at my school so that then if any kid had a birthday and brought in treats, 
then the teacher would know to get out one of my vegan cupcakes or, you know, one of my vegan snacks. So it wasn't always exactly the same as what the other kids were eating, but it would at least be a special treat that I also liked and was special for me. Right. Um, Let's, let's uh, talk a little bit now about how you became a teacher and then how that segued into what you're doing now. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So I feel like I've, I've really always been an educator at heart. Like that's, I love sharing information. And this was true even when I was a small child growing up vegan. Once, you know, my parents taught me the truth about, you know, how meat and dairy got to the plate and everything, then I was going around sharing that information with other kids, handing them leaflets, flyers, telling them what gelatin was and how it was made. How did that go? You know, how did that go (laughs) when you did that? Um, You know, it, it depends on the situation in, you know, like sixth grade in particular, where I was doing a lot of that. I kind of jokingly say like half the class hated me and half the class went vegetarian. So Oh, great. Tom Vincent um, has a comment. I still have a hard time getting my family to get uh, to get me vegan snacks. Mm. They're getting better at it. And I think that's something a lot of people, particularly right after Thanksgiving, a lot of people struggle with that. We're going to get into, you're going to talk a little bit more about dealing with that a little bit later. But I did want to mention that as a teacher, you are actually, a, you were a science teacher for, in high school. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So I studied biochemistry in college and then ended up teaching high school in Kansas City for a couple of years, chemistry and uh, advanced placement, um, environmental science, AP environmental science. So I taught nice. both of those for um, some time. And, and you know, it, it kind of came from, from my, my passion for education, but also really my passion for critical thinking, which is what I kind of feel like, you know, my parents taught me to do by growing up vegan in a non-vegan world where I had to learn to read labels and, and do things different than other people were doing and recognize that the information other people believed to be true, you know, wasn't necessarily in line with science and, and, um, you know, nutrition evidence and things like that. So it, it's really, you know, all about that critical thinking and questioning. And I had a passion for that. And so that kind of bled into science and doing research at one point and then teaching high school as well. So we have a question from Ken Sills. Hi, Ken. Thanks for watching. Were you bullied in school because of your vegan choice? Now, you kind of already addressed that. But where, you know, and where did you go to school? Because my question is, do you think, and you could have really good, person to ask this question. Do you think your experience would have been the same if you lived in a part of the U.S.? Um, I think it would have been different. Uh, there's, you know, different environments. I'm sure New York City probably would have been a lot more vegan friendly even in the 90s yeah. um, than, you know, Kansas. And I did a bunch of different schooling. So like I homeschooled at times. I did a Montessori school, I did a Waldorf school, I did a public middle school, and then public high school as well, Um, but all mixed up in different different orders, different times. Um, So I was in a, a lot of different environments, which I actually think was really helpful. It wasn't like I went through one small school system where I was with the same set of people from, you know, first grade onwards. I had the opportunity if things if I did get bullied or if things went south in one environment Mm -hmm. to then be in a completely different environment with a whole new group of people. So that Um, made it easier for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, I tried different things in different environments. There were times where I would say like, and so most of the, the pushback or issues I had with students were because I was being kind of an activist. So I brought a lot of it on myself And then there would be times where I'd kind of get tired of that and didn't like feeling like so many people disliked me. And so then I'd go into a new school environment and say like, oh, you know, I'm just going to be a little bit more normal right now. Like, I'm not going to I'm not going to be an activist right now in this school environment. Like, I want to make friends or, you know, um, and and that I'd go through cycles. Friendship sometimes. (laughs) No, I agree. Um, It does. I, I was just thinking of all the people that I don't see anymore because I'm vegan. But. It is what it is, you know? 
Yeah. 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 So definitely went through cycles of like how out there or in your face I was um, versus not. And um, I had, yeah, different, different experiences with that. But most of, most of the issues I had were again, because I was being kind of in people's face. Um, but I did have some teachers in a good that way. were not, yeah, both in, in like sixth grade and then also in high school, I had some teachers that, especially looking back, I'm like, that was really not a super appropriate way to handle <laughs> a child with, um, that was vegan or eating different food. <laughs> But yeah, so you've had a lot of experiences and that makes you such a great person to be going on and doing all these different lectures. And I love the way and we're going to get into your lectures in a moment, um, but I love the way you have them geared towards whatever audience, you know, this is good for children. And we did have a question about that, just to pop this in quickly. Um, not the, how do you uh, teach children? This one, Tom Vincel. I ask you, how do you teach kids about veganism? But um, yeah, that's something we're going to go into. But I want you to talk about because we're I'm pushing it along because we're we're at a you know loss for time. Um, where you went from the science to also incorporating the spiritual aspect, and you made a decision to stop teaching. So maybe take us through that path a little bit. Yeah. So the, and I call it heart. Like I say, I'm combining heart and science. And I say that because, and to me, heart is like a, a holistic and includes ethics and morality. And it's more than just like, you know, oh, what is the evidence or what does this single study say? And I think that's really important because, you know, my experience in the sciences, both, you know, doing research, participating in high school, I competed in science fairs and then on to teaching science is not inherently ethical or moral on its own. And so I think we can sort of be led astray in society if we get too focused purely on, you know, just the science without applying a human moral framework and our ethics to it. So what I do is kind of say, like, we need both. We need a holistic, like, what really makes sense, you know, ethically and just logically in terms of being good people on the planet, being compassionate, empathetic individuals that want to create a better, more just and peaceful world and bringing in that science and evidence of sustainability and nutrition and things to kind of create that holistic perspective of what we really need to do to make a better world. So that's kind of always been my approach and that's, that's my unique take now. And so while I was teaching high school, I actually had the opportunity to create and develop a vegan workshop that I taught to, you know, um, 60 plus high school students while I was at this high school. And I had such a good experience with that and saw such amazing results and feedback from, um, you know, being able to do hands-on vegan education, cooking demos, class discussions, interactive activities, all of this that I really, you know, kind of decided I wanted to do that full time. Like I love teaching, but I didn't love teaching chemistry and environmental science. I wanted to teach veganism. I wanted to combine that, that heart and science together um, for a holistic, you know, what can we as individuals do to make the world better and, and bring our daily actions into alignment with our values. Right. Um, Let's... <laughs> Let's take a look quickly here at your website. They bring it up here for us, if I can. Yeah. So, oh, Born Vegan. So yeah, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what information you, we won't be able to go through the whole thing. So tell people, talk a little bit about your website, how people can reach you, what they can find on there. Let's do that now. So we okay. Yeah. So my, my website is kind of my hub for everything. I have some blog posts and articles on there, but then links to all of my YouTube videos. I have a podcast called the science is gray podcast, all based on this idea of, you know, we need to merge science and ethics for this holistic perspective that science alone isn't enough or isn't inherently, you know, just, 
um, all about my van tour and, and the vegan workshops I'm giving and speaking. All of that is on there so you can access all of my content um, and contact me as well. And I do have a free vegan living essentially starter guide that if you sign up for my email list on here, um, that will get emailed to you. It has you know, my top 10 tips for how to, you know, transition vegan. Um, and then, you know, a recipe in there as well. So these are some of, yeah, my, my blog posts and essays. <laughs> um, and I'm uh, but because that most annoying question to all vegans, <laughs> where do you get your protein, but it definitely needs to be answered. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so and some of these others look really interesting as well. So folks can come on over here and learn all about you and contact you. And then you also have your YouTube channel. And so are you actually uh, posting ways for people to create meals, et cetera? Do you do that on your Instagram and, and all of that? A like little bit. My Instagram is definitely my most active platform right now. And I, you know, like the video you showed, um, it's mainly kind of the things I do. I kind of serve as an example. So I'll show people some of the meals and instant pot things. And I have a whole um, story uh, feature that has like every time I eat food, <laughs> I post pictures of it. So you can click through and see, and it'll give you a really good example of like just how varied vegan diets can be and that they're not boring and they're a whole range of food. You know, so I, I kind of just showcase that and try to show people how easy it can be to be vegan wherever I am, wherever you are traveling. Um, it can be as healthy or junk food or, you know, like whatever you want to make it um, to be, there's like all the options for that. So, and I, I think that really that. kills that whole argument that it's too hard to go. And if you can go vegan in a van <laughs> and enjoy your meals, then people certainly with all the restaurant options, et cetera, and grocery store options we have can go vegan if they really have it in their heart. And I love mm -hmm. what you say about the spiritual side of it, of uh, that science we must also think with our heart. We have to have both because science innately is not, you, you know, it's logic. It's about logic. It's black and white. And we, and that's not, that's only part of what we need. It's so great that you're bringing all of that out. I love that. And I, I just wanted to go over here and just mention a couple of the, um, now, when you travel around in the van, you go and do lectures different places and you have different keynotes. And I just, I'll mention them and then you can just maybe say a few words. So the first one, the power of our fork, that one sounded so interesting. Just briefly tell us about that and then we'll go on to the others and just mention them all. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of where I explain to people some of the basic facts and information about our food system and our food choices, the science and sustainability of, you know, animal-based products versus plant-based products, the ethics, of course, I, I bring up, you know, ethical and moral questions for people. And, and I tell a little bit of my personal story of growing up vegan and how, you know, some of the stuff we've talked about here about, you know, brainwashing and, and society and, and their propaganda and how influential that can be. But really, you know, the, the point of it is the power of our fork. It's really trying to empower individuals who say that they care about not hurting animals, who say they're animal lovers, who say they care about peace and justice and sustainability to then be empowered to actually bring their daily actions, the food they eat and put on the end of their fork three times a day, you know, into alignment with those values they say they hold so that they're actually being the change that they want to see. That's really the root message of that. Great. And then the next one is, um, well, did you talk about the change they want to see? So beyond sustainability, why using holistic veganism and total liberation is key to migrating climate change or mitigating, sorry, mitigating climate change and healing the planet. How about that one? Yeah. So that one is really in line with the work I'm doing, organizing the Worldwide Vegan Climate March which is, you know, basically there's a lot of momentum around climate change. There's a lot of concern for environmental sustainability. And yet the vast majority of the, the, the activists, even the nonprofits, the governments, people talking about this are completely ignoring the role that animal agriculture plays in causing climate change and all of our other environmental problems. And at the same time, you know, 
some people are starting to talk about the ethics of, um, you know, the human impact of climate change, things like environmental racism and how environmental problems are affecting different communities at different times and in different ways. And there's, you know, already existing disparities that are being exacerbated there. And yet no one is really talking about the impact that climate and environmental problems have on animals and our fellow earthlings as well. And so again, it's that combining heart and science and talking about how like, we need this holistic approach, we need a plant based food system to mitigate, if we truly care about mitigating the environmental problems and climate crisis, we need that. And at the same time, we have to actually also bring the ethics and animals into the conversation. And it's, it's beyond sustainability, because, you know, at the at the end of the day, we don't talk about whether or not it's sustainable to kill humans, because we're being overpopulated, or whether it's more sustainable to you know, like, like do horrible things to humans in the name of sustainability. We recognize that morals and ethics matter. And yet we're still stuck on this conversation purely of sustainability and not recognizing the individual, you know, bodily autonomy and, and right to life of the animals that we're killing or not in the name of sustainability. Well, you know, it's so interesting you say that because I can even feel myself sometimes as a vegan activist when I'm talking to someone and I see like they're blocking their empathy and there's, you know, like they're kind of giving you that like, oh, animals, you know, that, that look like they totally don't get it. I jump to the, oh, here's how it's going to affect you and just kind of gloss over. And I think it's so great that you're calling them out on, hey, this is really, really messed up. And we're, and, and you know, it's, you're messing with, you know, something that never come back, never, once it's gone. And that yeah. whole thing, you know, I do, I wash over it. I'm glad you reminded me. Thank you for that. I'm getting emotional here, but <laughs> seriously. And I think the one other one we didn't cover was a university lecture. And I love this because of what's been going on in the schools shootings, et cetera, normalized violence, the global, global impact of our daily choices. Do you want to talk about that? Because believe it or not, we're almost out of time. But okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So that is the main lecture I'm giving right now. And that is where I really, again, kind of that still root asking people, you know, are you living in alignment with your values? But I really approach it from like, what values do we all say we care about? What values do you care about? And then I present facts about what actually happens to animals in our food system, the facts, uh, sustainability and the science of what's going on and, you know, details about how animals are oppressed in this system and, and how that is also linked and interconnected with human oppression in this system in all different ways. And then really raising that question for students of if any of the things I'm saying bother you or you care about creating a more peaceful, compassionate world, are you living in alignment with that? Are you making daily choices that put us closer to the kind of world you'd like to see or that take us farther away from that? And so it's really, um, you know, that a very basic in some ways, you know, why do our vegan choices matter and our food choices matter? But in the, the context of, you know, justice and sustainability and nonviolence. Right. And I just want to bring up the vegan climate march coming up before we completely run out of time here. So would you talk about that? I'm having trouble bringing up the website, but people can go to this veganclimatemarch.org. So easy to remember. Tell us a little bit about it. And then I want to get a few minutes to just wrap up anything we haven't covered that you think might be important. So talk about the vegan march first, though, please. Yeah, so I'm co I'm the co-founder and co-organizer of the Worldwide Vegan Climate March, which will be taking place on May 6th, 2023, and it's worldwide. And so we're kind of modeling it after like the youth climate strikes from 2019 and youth climate marches, where we hope that people nice. in cities around the world are all mobilizing on the same day. But we have several clear demands where we are saying, you know, one, individuals that care about the environment and can need to go vegan. Like we have to take individual responsibility. And two, governments need to end subsidies for animal agriculture and really level the playing field so that we're not propping up these harmful industries. So we have an individual 
demand, kind of a government demand. And then we're also asking for people or institutions and governments to endorse the plant-based treaty for that you know, policy. Basically all around, we're demanding a transition to a sustainable, ethical, veganic, which is vegan and organic, you know, plant-based food system if we really, you know, care about the climate and environment. And so, like I said, it's like that talk where I kind of talk about that. Um, but basically we need people in cities around the world to step up. We have a form on our website. If anybody wants to become a re regional organ, and we'll be in touch soon and walking people through the steps. We'll be providing, you know, the messaging and the chance and kind of this global big picture of what we're doing. And we hope to, you know, get many, many cities and hundreds of people, if not thousands of people turning out all around the world saying we need to end animal agriculture now. I just want to jump in because you did uh, break up a little bit there when you were saying that if people get involved and become part of uh, an a set up in their area, uh, become part of it, you uh, they would get in touch with you. So maybe just repeat how they get in touch with you there because I didn't hear you either. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So there's a form on the website under like how to become an organizer that you can fill out if you want to actually help bring a march to your city and region. And then we'll be in touch following up, providing resources and steps and trainings for how to actually do that. If you just want updates or maybe want to attend or volunteer, you can also sign up for our email list on the Vegan Climate March website as well. Perfect. So we're just about out of time, but I do want to give you a couple of moments here at the end. Is there anything we didn't talk that you would like to cover? Um, I think we've Any been covering final words it pretty well. <laughs> I think um, we do too. If, if not, that's fine. But either way. Yeah. Um, basically, I'll, I'll reiterate my message, which is, you know, I, I really believe in the power of individuals. We all are walking billboards and examples of the kind of world we want to see. And even if our choices, which they do, but even if they didn't have any kind of direct physical impact, we still are influencing everyone around us by being a living example and, and, and embodying the values and world we want to see. And that's so incredibly powerful. We all need to remember that and not forget that we are powerful agents of change just through what we do and how we live our lives. Thank you so much for reminding those of us that are activists. And for those of you that are not, that want to get involved, and this is so inspirational, get in touch with Serena. She is going to show you how to get started and follow her on YouTube. All the links will be up available to you in just a couple of moments. So thank you so much, Serena, for being on today and for imparting all this amazing wisdom that you have with us. It was really amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, hang on a moment. I'm going to go off. Bye, everyone, but stay on. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs>